<laughs> Some of them got in the long end, I know for sure. Anyway, <clears throat> they, uh, they've been maligned and talked bad about for way too long, and I just wanted them to be able to tell their own stories. And that's all this is. It's 24 stories by 24 groupie girls from Tura Satana, oh. who had sex with Elvis, <laughs> to a fabulous young girl named Static Beth who has pictures of rock star Dick online. So I'm just, I'm just going to start. I'm just going to read the intro so you'll see what, why I wrote this thing. And then the wonderful Patty Darbinville is going to read. <laughs> And another wonderful groupie, proud groupie girl came all the way from Colorado, Patty Johnson, to read about Billy Idol. So. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> As a young girl, I was drawn to Jesus. He was the first rock star. We all know that. Even though my parents weren't religious and rarely went to church, my sweet perceptive mother made sure the good book was handy, and for my 12th birthday, my dear Aunt Edna got me my first white leather-bound gilt-edged Bible, which I still have. I voraciously studied the New Testament, especially the words printed in red ink, the words he said. It wasn't long before I hung photos of Elvis next to the huge color portrait of a glittery Jesus that my dad brought home from Mexico. The way I felt about these icons was strangely similar, with one blasphemous exception. The king made me feel giddy and horny, while the king of kings made me feel guilty about it. When I was about 13, I had just started rocking out. The pastor at the Methodist church I'd recently joined stated that dancing was a sin. I was dumbstruck and poured through the pages of my Bible, looking for the verse that made this horrid proclamation. I never found it, but aha! Psalm 150 says, praise him with timbrel and dancing. Wow, I had no idea what timbrel was, but the passage gave me mighty relief. Until I left the square churches behind and started calling Laurel Canyon God's golden backyard, I assumed that the oft-mentioned Mary Magdalene was a fallen whore whom Christ had redeemed. I thought it was cool that he risked his reputation by defending such a wicked girl and many other so-called outcasts. If Jesus had saved such a tragic wretch, there must be hope for me. But even before I discovered the truth, I suspected there was more to the story than a rehabilitated hooker. After all, Magdalene was the only recorded female disciple and the first person he appeared to after the stone was rolled away. As a teenager, I read The Last Temptation of Christ by Nikos Kazantzakis, and a massive jumble of guilt was suddenly lifted. It gave me solace that besides being holy, Jesus was also a man who struggled with life just like we all do. I went digging again. Where exactly in the Bible did it say that Magdalene was a whore? Guess what? It doesn't. 1,700 years ago, an early church father, read pious jackass, turned several shameless women in the Bible into one immoral sinner, and Jesus' beloved muse disappeared. Long before the Da Vinci Code, before the books, documentaries, and discussions about what Magdalene's real relationship with Jesus might have been, I went on a quest to discover her true identity. I even took a vacation to Israel and wandered around Magdala, the seaside town where she was born. Shortly after my trip, I discovered an ancient Gnostic text, the Gospel according to Mary Magdalene, confirming my suspicions that she was indeed the Lord's beloved. The disciple Peter asks, did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Levi answers, but if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Since I have personally experienced the cosmic closeness that can evolve between a creative genius and an adoring fan, I began to see the Lord's closest companion as the first genuine groupie muse. In fact, the dedication in my book Rock Bottom reads, To my soul sister Mary Magdalene, the verse groupie. I was also inspired to write a poem about her. If I had been Mary Magdalene, I would have kissed the hem of his garment. Nothing could have stopped me from stroking his immaculate thigh, bearing my quivering soul to this God-made flesh, this light dipped in hell, come to secure my soul from the clutches of the unholy temple, made holy by his caress. From my newfound revelations and ongoing communication with the spirit of Magdalene, the idea to write a book about modern day muses started swirling around my head. This is a quote from Patti Smith. 
I think Mary Magdalene was so cool. She was like the first groupie. I mean, she was really into Jesus and, the fo and following him around, and I wish she would have left a diary. I mean, all this stuff about Jesus, how wonderful he was and how he's going to save us. All I'd like to know if he, if he was a good lay. That interests me. <laughs> According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a muse is a source of inspiration, a guiding spirit. I believe this describes the role of the groupie. A brilliant creative man is often brought to the height of his genius by the muse. Throughout the ages, such women have helped revolutionize the arts. The ancient Greeks brought us the nine muses that are prodigious loins of Zeus, and since then, attention and blessings from a muse are certain to stimulate any mere, mere mortal's creative juices. Happy. He, whomsoever the muses shall have loved, wrote Hesiod, sweet is the sound that flows from his mouth. When Dante Alighieri first laid eyes on his beloved Beatrice, they were only nine years old. And even after her untimely death, his paradiso acknowledges her profound, inescapable influence on his every word. Salvador Dali's tempestuous wife, Gala, was so roundly recognized as her husband's muse that when, a surreal, when the surrealistic painter was on a roll, he was said to be in love with Gala, when a surrealistic painter. Any, any painter was, was said to be in love with Gala. And although Zelda's ecstatic miseries tortured F. Scott Fitzgerald, she was constant fodder for his art. I married one of my heroines, he once said, and admitted to lifting large portions of Zelda's diaries for the beautiful and the damned. Constance Mozart, given little respect by historians, was so adored by her husband that he couldn't bear being away from her. I kiss and squeeze you so many times, I don't know what the number is, it's in the trillions, I'm sure. He wrote in a letter. And to his sister, he wrote, when Constance hears the fugue, she absolutely fell in love with them. She scolded me roundly for not recording some of my compositions in this most artistic and beautiful of all musical forms and gave me no peace until I wrote down a fugue for her. After his death at 36 in 1791, Constance spent the next 50 years making sure Mozart would never be forgotten. She obviously loved his music. The music, the music, always the music. No matter how she is reviewed, viewed by those who believe she busted up the Fab Four, John Lennon obviously believed that Yoko Ono was his muse. With us, it's a teacher-pupil relationship. That's what people didn't understand. She's the teacher and I'm the pupil. I'm the famous one. I'm supposed to know everything, but she taught me everything I fucking know. Yoko set her sights on John, even waited by his gate before d finally drawing him into one of her art shows. As usual, he said, paraphrasing the cliché, there is a great woman behind every idiot. <laughs> All creative souls need passionate encouragement from devoted admirers. There have always been dewy-eyed believers standing in the wings, eager to offer themselves up to the source of the enchantment. The phenomenon is nothing new. It's an ancient, enduring practice that will continue as long as artists feel the desire to create. I'm sure Beethoven's masterpieces aroused exquisite longing within audience members, and Mario Lanza's operatics inspired weak-kneed adoration. Sinatra's intrepid Bobby Soxers waited by the stage door to get a glimpse of the swing and crooner, but nothing is sexier than rock and roll. I was a preteen when Ed Sullivan chopped Elvis off at the waist so we couldn't see his hellfire swivel hips, and I was contaminated right there and then. From that long ago illicit moment to last night's rowdy MTV awards, sensuality has oozed through the amplifiers, spilled from guitar strings, and dibbled, dribbled down microphone stands, wreaking riotous havoc. The word groupie started out innocently enough. I remember the first time I heard it spoken at the Continental Hyatt Riot House on the Sunset Strip. I was standing by Led Zeppelin's shiny black limo, smoothing my pink feather boa, reapplying my gooey Yardley slicker lip gloss, preparing to slide in next to Jimmy Page for a hot